Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm sure you all know who's on the call and who'll be presenting, but I'll still say it anyway. I'll hand it over to Philip and then Philip, um, you can take it from there. Philip is the functional manager for the engineering team at HeartRound. Um, yeah, so Philip, are you ready? Yes. Um, so uh, thanks all and welcome. Um, sorry for the delays. Uh, it's a typical thing of you test it out and test it out again. And then when it's time to act, um, it just doesn't work. Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, I'm going to leave the camera off for now due to all of these technical difficulties. Um, but you all know how I look, and I believe you also have met Peter before in the past. Today, uh, we'll start out with a disclaimer that we are dealing with a lot of history here, and the dates and some of the information uh, as it's, uh, it has been gathered around, around stories and so forth. So if you have any um, insight into our inaccuracies, let us know and we'll update that as we go along. In terms of the presentation, it will mostly be pictures. Um, this sort of grew from an initial engineering presentation to now sort of an organization wide one, um, but we'll keep the engineering talk to a minimum uh, and hopefully keep it interesting for you um, so that whether you're in engineering or in finance or wherever, uh, you'll still like it. Um, and if we tell you something is impressive, you can take our word for it. Uh, Peter will also be talking and I'll hand it over to him now uh, where he'll take, uh, take us through the history. Um, after that, I'll talk a bit about Vigas uh, and uh, we'll, we'll swap and change as we go along. So yeah, Peter, off to you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, before I start off, uh, a special word of welcome uh, to, we've got our special guest of honor here, uh, Dr. George Nicholson and his son, Brett. Uh, very warm welcome to you. It's uh, 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 an honor to have you here, and uh, we hope you enjoy this as much as uh, the rest of staff. So the, the site started in 1960, which is quite a long time ago, and it's, it's a lot of history to, to condense in a short time. So we're going to try our best to, to uh, take you through it. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Um, the project started, well, probably before 1960 already, but in South Africa, it started in 1960. Um, this is uh, what the site looked like then before construction started. Uh, NASA looked for a site to put up an earth station in South Africa. Um, and they had specific specifications for it. It needed to be in a valley to shield it from RFI, far enough from civilization, again, for RFI, but they wanted it close enough to civilization so that they can get spare parts and uh, transport uh, in and out uh, of the site. And uh, eventually, uh, Harpiesuk Valley was selected uh, to build this uh, antenna. Um, this view is from the from the North Hill, which is uh, Seikerbos Rand, and in the foreground you can actually see the Seikerbos uh, on the on the side of the mountain. Um, going down into the valley, they needed to construct a road to get everything in. So that was the first to to be constructed. Um, uh, was the road down into the valley? Um, the foundations for the 26 meter or the 85 foot antenna, as I believe, was cast on Christmas Day, 1960. Um, the project was quite hurried because they needed to get it ready for the first mission, which was Ranger 1, 
which was in uh, July of uh, 1961. So they were in quite a hurry to get everything ready for them. With the polar mount antenna, it's quite critical to survey the foundation and the mounting in very carefully because everything else relied on, on that because you cannot calibrate it out as with a SL antenna these days where you basically survey the antenna in after you build it. There you had to survey in the foundations very carefully before everything. And if, if you get it wrong, then the whole antenna is, is wrong. So NASA was in, like I said, in a, in a big hurry and they sent their best steel worker team from the States and uh, this is their field mess. And you can see the guys were well looked after uh, uh, in terms of catering and, and comforts. That a special South African kitchen to provide them with uh, the food. And then construction started. Uh, first, the legs went up. Uh, this is a, a photo of the north leg being uh, put in place. So everything arrived here in crates uh, pre-manufactured from the States. And then uh, sub-assemblies were assembled on, on the ground and then hoisted into place. And in that way, the whole antenna took shape quite quickly. Um, See the next one. There we go. So this is an interesting uh, photograph. It's also in, in the um, invite. And it was sent by uh, Mr. Ruli van Weyck, who was um, contracted to do the um, photography for the construction of the antenna. And it's a picture of that he sent us of him taking an aerial shot uh, suspended from the, uh, from the jib uh, of, the, of the crane, um, taking aerial shots of the construction. So there's Mr. Van Weyck uh, taking his, his picture. I'm not sure if this, is, this would be allowed these days, but yeah. Uh, Everything had to come down that newly constructed road into the valley. And uh, the, uh, when the, if you've visited the site, then you would know that it's quite a, quite a road going down into the valley. And that road has claimed a number of casualties. Um, we've had uh, two diesel tankers overturn down the road, a concrete truck, a fertilizer truck, two tractors, numerous cars. So uh, yeah, it was quite a, a dangerous piece of three kilometer road down into the valley. Initially, the site didn't have um, utility power from supply from ESCOM. So they were reliant on uh, diesel generators to provide power for the site. And uh, this is a photo of the generator house. Um, and there was also a petrol station for uh, providing fuel for, for the vehicles on site. Now, this is a photo of inside of the, of the gen house uh, with three of the V16 Caterpillar generators. And uh, back in the days, uh, all of those synchronization and switching was done manually. Um, quite a, a scary thought that, um, but yeah. Uh, the inside of the control room uh, back in the days, uh, most of these racks have been removed and replaced with smaller equipment as it is today, uh, much more condensed. Um, although some of the racks we still use today and um, the ones in the corner here, 
um, are still in place. And later you will see a, a photo of those racks that's, that's still in use today. The official opening was on the 8th of September, 1961. And um, if you picked it up, yes, it is only half of the buildings. Um, the, there were some uh, additions. The buildings was enlarged uh, later in 63. Um, so this, this wall is actually no more because this is half of the off of the construct, uh, off of the control room, and those windows there are the the, the uh, office wing. So this is before the electronic workshop and mechanical workshop wing was added, and the con uh, the control room was enlarged, and the old west wing was added in 1963. This is Dr. Hewitt, which was the director of the uh, Institute for, now I, I need to see my notes, um, which was the division of the, of the CSIR. And um, with him is, uh, let me just get that. Um, where is my, uh, this is, um, the Minister of Economic Affairs and um, Mines, uh, Nick Diederichs, and sorry about that. And uh, behind him uh, is uh, Foster, who was um, Deputy Minister, and he later became uh, Prime Minister and President of South Africa. Aerial photo of the site in 1960, uh, 61, um, just showing the 26 meter, 85 foot and the control building. A recent uh, satellite image uh, from Google Earth um, shows the site now a bit more equipment and expanded. Um, now we have uh, the Vigos antenna there, which you will hear about a li little bit later. Uh, there's also a Hyrax array. Um, there's the 15 meter or XDM antenna, uh, 7.6 meter here at the gate, uh, some geodesy equipment, satellite laser ranger, uh, two of them. Um, and over here, there's uh, some more uh, geodesy equipment, seismometer, gravity meter, so this is the main building uh, where you can now see the electronic workshop and mechanical workshop, the larger control room and the west wing. This is just a, a screenshot uh, from the NASA website. Um, where they show a picture of the, the prime focus um, antenna as it was built in 1960. And um, I want to draw your attention to the, the quad leg. So this was a prime focus 960 meg uh, antenna and the quad legs were tubular aluminum section, um, eight inch, uh, eight inch diameter with a 5 16th wall thickness. And uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit about that later on in the presentation. Then there was in 1963, uh, the, there was 64 was uh, a series of upgrades to the antenna. 63, like I said, there was uh, expansion of the buildings. Um, 64, they the antenna was converted from a prime focus uh, 960 megahertz to a Cassegrain configuration uh, uh, S-band 2.2 gig. Um, then the next 
um, upgrade, it was in 68, and that was quite extensive uh, upgrade where the original feed cone was replaced with a new one. Um, there were some structural um, upgrades as well, strengthening of the hour angle wheel counterweight box, uh, new declination bearings was installed. Um, there you can see the new S-band feed cone uh, getting ready to be hoisted up. Um, and uh, there it goes to be mounted on what we still refer to today uh, as the, the elephant base, uh, which is a, the circular structure in the, in the vertex of the antenna. Also with uh, some developments at the top station, which is today Sansa, um, they also get a, a got power from the same generator house. There was a series. Uh, there were two step up generator, two step up transformers that stepped up the the voltage from the generators to 11 kV and then transported up the hill um, three kilometers to the the Sansa uh, station, and then there it was distributed again, but still relying on on diesel power for for uh, prime power. The original antenna had a mesh surface like a, like a bry grid. It was expanded metal, uh, aluminum uh, mesh surface. And that was also replaced in, in 68 with a perforated aluminum sheets. So they just got in with uh, air hammers and uh, stripped off the, the, the mesh surface and then screwed down the the perforated sheets onto the original frames. And with construction and repairs and maintenance, things don't always go as planned. Yeah, they almost set the antenna on fire. Whilst working on the um, our angle drive skid, uh, some welding and cutting was done whilst equipment was stored underneath the antenna covered with a tarpaulin and uh, yeah uh, it didn't end well fortunately the antenna didn't uh, suffer any damage uh, it was just uh, some equipment at the bottom bottom but uh, was quickly recovered this is a slide showing where they uh, how they got the the new drive uh, gearboxes and motor assembly in place, sliding it, winching it up a, a skid into position uh, on the hour angle skid. Then in 1973, NASA terminated their deep space um, facilities and they announced that they will close the Artebius Hook site. And since it was still um, operated and managed by the CSIR, uh, it was then largely to, to, because of George's influence and dedication and the science that he already did, that this was then converted into a national facility for radio astronomy. And also, together with the University of Rhodes, they played a, a huge role in convincing the authorities to, to take this over and to then run this as a fully fledged radio astronomy observatory. Um, a portion of the land was sold off to Telcom to develop the Earth Station for the uh, satellite downlink for South African telecommunications. And they then managed to get utility power to that site. And that line was then extended to the gen house. So then finally we, we got Eskom power. And for prime 
prime power, we then used one of the Caterpillar uh, generators, we stripped that, used uh, the alternator and a synchronous motor to drive that alternator through a reduction gearbox to convert the 50 hertz to 60 hertz. And so from there on, the, the prime power was, was ESCOM with backup power via the Caterpillar diesel generators. So this is the, a picture of the Vorrad Wolkemade. And one would wonder what has that got to do with radio astronomy or the site? And it's an interesting story that I learned that the Vorrad Wolkemade uh, is a large tugboat, one of two. Uh, his sister ship is the John Ross. Vorrad Wolkemade was built in, in the UK, the John Ross in Durban. And their prime task was to assist uh, large oil tankers around the Cape Coast, um, tankers that was too large to go through the Suez Canal. And the CSIR was also involved in the specification and design of these vessels. And they needed um, a diesel generator that could supply 480 volts, three phase power that they could connect to stranded or, or uh, yeah, stranded ships uh, that would that was on tow. And since we just recently in uh, 75 um, got ESCOM power, some of our generators became redundant. And one of those V16 uh, Caterpillar generators was then donated and used on board the Volrod Voltemada until it's uh, uh, was decommissioned in 2010, I think. So this is just a quick timeline of uh, basically what I've presented so far. And you can just read through. Yeah, so if we fast forward then a couple of years, um, the antenna, the 26 meter antenna still used hydraulic drive system all the way up to 1980, uh, 1998. And then that was upgraded um, with, a, with a VSD electric drives. So this is just an image of the drive cabinet uh, that was built and supplied by E.P. Norman. And then the interfacing for that was all uh, homemade uh, in-house. And you can see that is still the original NASA racks that we utilized uh, with, the, with the modern um, equipment. And that part over there is the, the interface, computer interface, and then at the bottom is the manual antenna drive. The next big uh, upgrade project that we did was in 1999, and that was to enable us to go to higher frequencies. We needed to have a solid surface. So up to now, we still had the the perforated sheets, uh, perforated uh, surface from 1968. And so now we set off to replace that surface with a solid uh, sheet surface. Of course, it's not easy to just shut down an antenna for a long time and upgrade it. We needed to do the project in a way that 
kept the antenna operational during that time. So the antenna, the, the surface consists of 252 uh, panels in seven rings. So we started off with the outer ring, ring one, and removed the uh, eight panels that were shattered by the quad legs. And that was to minimize the effect of the, of, uh, that it had on the, on the performance uh, during this time. So those panels were then uh, retrofitted with a, with a new solid surface. And then systematically they went into uh, place in, uh, in the other spaces between the, between the quad legs uh, until the ring was completed. And then the next ring would be tackled in the same manner. It went, oops, uh, I just lost my, there. Let's just see. Um, yeah, so that's just a, a picture of the uh, bed of bolts. The, it was a, also a local designed and built a jig for uh, making the new panels. The, the panels as they came out were stripped off the, the, the angle rips uh, inside the panel were stripped out and replaced with high profile um, uh, rips that were also shaped to this, the curvature. Um, in the corners, we welded in new um, gussets for the new uh, panel adjusters. And then the surface was replaced with a um, solid aluminum sheet surface. Eventually in 2005, we completed that. And that is a photo just before the last panels were to be fitted. And it was a joyous occasion. All the heavy people were there to witness and uh, make sure everything is done correctly. The last one there in, gets installed by uh, the late Mr. Simon Meraki and Andrew Masiteng. Then it was another odd job to do was to site in and adjust this new surface. So 252 panels each with between four and six adjusters. Uh, it's quite a quite a job. Uh, in the inside the elephant in the in the center of the vertex under the the feet cone. Uh, in in that elephant base, there's a theodolite mount, and that is used then with a Hilgo and Watts theodolite to sight in radially to each of the panel uh, corners where there was a a target, and then each adjuster would be set in turn. And uh, we did that at night uh, to minimize the thermal effects. Um, and it, yeah, it, it gets cold there at night. And it's quite a, quite a joke. 2006 was the start of the XDM. Uh, one can say the the tangible start of, of what is to become the SKA. Uh, the XDM was a, was a demonstrator, experimental demonstrator for the SKA project. And it was constructed here on the Artrau site. Um, the companies that were involved at that time was IST, um, uh, IST, MMS, Telemat, EMSS. Um, there you can see that this was a, a SL um, antenna and the azimuth uh, yoke beams uh, lower down onto the slew bearing. There's the antenna completed shortly after um, construction. Of course, the 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 surface was also um, solid surface um, composite design. The mold can be seen in the background under the top. 
the antenna was con was fitted with a seven feet prime focus uh, receiver L band, 1.4 gigahertz. And um, it was for me not a very nice, well, this is personal view now, not a <laughs> very nice mounting of a receiver because um, having to fit this thing up and down uh, during the, the testing phase where adjustments needed to be done and, and you had to work at prime focus, um, fitting and taking it down was, it was quite a, a pain. Um, so I was glad that when we finally uh, done with the test and we um, could get rid of that uh, receiver, we stripped it down and used it for all kinds of other things, um, some of them more useful. Uh, we then redesigned a new receiver to go onto the XDM so that we could reuse that antenna for geodetic VLBI. And for that purpose, you need a um, dual band, S and X band, dual polarization, uh, cryogenic receiver. And uh, this was the result that we came up with, uh, the inside of the cryo um, receiver. And this is where uh, things get interesting because um, people that visited here and looked at our receivers will, would have noticed one thing, that all our receivers are constructed within um, a very limited uh, space, um, our real estate for, for developing cryostats is, is always the same. And it's, it's eight inch diameter on the inside and then whatever length uh, we need it. And that is because the, the tubular sections that we use for, the, for our cryostats are all leftover pieces of the original prime focus uh, 26 meter quad legs. So we utilize the, the old quad legs of the original antenna for our cryostat housings. That is the, the SX receiver uh, now fully with the feet and the supporting post amp box and uh, control electronics in the, in the white box. The white control box sits right at the apex in the sun. Uh, and that uh, we learned is a quite a harsh environment. So inside we use a, a motorbike oil cooler with a computer fan as a air conditioning system inside. And that keeps the electronics nice and cool. The post amplification box and the phase scale box uses uh, also locally designed electronic enclosures, which is also water-cooled for temperature stabilization. Working at the apex of a prime focus antenna is always a pain. So we designed this uh, scaffolding platform to be bolted um, onto the Onto the quad, uh, onto the quad legs, um, for when we need to service and work on the on the receiver, and that makes life at the apex a little bit more comfortable. We even got a plug there for a coffee machine, if it takes really long. Right, and on that one, I'll take a bit over for the bigger side, um, as. I started out with the Vigos project here um, just after funding has been secured. Uh, so most of the paperwork has been done. And uh, the work left over was to build the Vigos antenna. So here in 2014, uh, we were busy just doing an RFI survey. Um, since 
it was quite some time and as Peter mentioned, there was not much civilization in the 60s. Now we have phones and 3G and all sorts. So it was a good idea just to make sure the site is still suitable. Then after that, 2015, we did some initial site clearing. Um, here we are using the cherry picker just to get an idea of the, the height of the Vega antenna. Um, typical placement and uh, what relation it has to the other antennas. So you see the 26 meter there in the background. Soon afterwards in 2016, we finally started uh, pouring foundations. So the hole you see there is a nine meter by nine meter hole, about three meters deep that Firstly, got filled with uh, mostly concrete before they started with the structural frame, um, the steelwork for the antenna foundations. And still 2016, uh, construction uh, continued. This is around November, I think, uh, where they're busy uh, fitting the uh, the it's a, a ring, um, a anchorage ring, they call it, which is fit here at the top and gets cast into the concrete. And that's the connection point between the static tower and eventually the Vigos uh, movable antenna. So there it was uh, done. Uh, this is April 2017. Um, just after all the parts have arrived from China and Germany. Hi, Philip. Sorry um, to interrupt you. Um, could you just pause for a second? We've lost power, so we're not seeing the images. Okay, that's fine. Let me um, reshare. Then uh, hopefully it comes back. Or is it just your screen that is off? It's just the screen that's off. So I guess, I mean, we can share the presentation with the photos, but um, I think it's useful to see them as you talk. Yes. Okay, we're back. Um, can you go maybe a photo back or two photos back, I think? Right, so I was talking about the tower, uh, the top, part of the tower, the anchorage ring, and before that, the base of the tower. Okay, I think this is where we cut off, right? Yeah, all right. All right, yeah, so uh, just re uh, repeating myself. So uh, after the, the bulk concrete was poured, um, the structural steel actually came in and uh, perhaps an additional note, this is the cable trench. Uh, that we're looking down in the base of the Vigas antenna. Um, and that is why there is a gap. And then in the end of uh, 2016, they were positioning the anchorage ring, which is the connection point between the static um, foundations, the tower foundation, and the movable uh, azimuth cabin uh, and upwards. So that's what they're uh, busy measuring in there. I think that that was about the only few other light type measurements we did beforehand. Here is in April 2017, where uh, you're at the back, you can see a lot of um, the parts. So all the reflector panels are there at the back. Here on the left hand side are the counterweights. Memory serves, they're about 10 and a half tons each. Um, and a lot of boxes with the sub reflector um, and so forth that have arrived on site uh, from Germany as well as from China. Skipping forward, I think two more months to June, um, and they've finished assembling the uh, main reflector. This is the day 
where everything really happened and a lifted uh, reflector to be bolted onto the uh, azimuth cabin. So for the Vegas antenna, it has a very small elevation cabin that forms part of the feed cone. Uh, you can't really see it here. Um, and the azimuth cabin that's already mounted there with the counterweights um, ready to receive. And then I have a short video for those who have not seen the Vigos dish in operation yet. I'm hoping it works out. So it's moving in azimuth 12 degrees a second and elevation six degrees per second. Um, and that was sort of the, the speeds that were decided for the new age geodetic VLBI instrument to be able to go quickly from one source to the next. And finally, and I'm not sure why it has skipped now. Let me just <laughs> put it in slideshow mode again. Um, at the moment, what you're seeing here um, is where we're, we're at at the moment. Uh, so we've appointed Yevis Observatory in Spain to uh, build a 2 to 14 gigahertz broadband cryogenic receiver for us. Uh, this photo is about two months old already, um, but here you can see it uh, well in progress. And um, I'll point your or uh, draw your attention to how this looks. And um, when Peter takes over now to talk about more on the RF and receiver side, you'll see that we are pretty much on the same ball game. Uh, we have the same attention to detail uh, as the, the Spaniards uh, have in this case. Thanks, uh, Philip. Yeah, so the next is uh, some of the receivers that we've done here at Artrau. Um, I mentioned about our standards uh, cryostat tubes, which is eight inch diameter. Uh, this one is the only exception to the rule. And uh, this is a new um, K-band antenna, K-band receiver uh, that we built for the, for the 26 meter. And the only reason why this one is so much smaller, only five inch diameter is because uh, on axis, uh, that was the space available on the antenna in the feed cone. So we couldn't use a eight inch tube because there was just not space uh, for, for it in the, in the feed cone. Um, so that is a inside view of the, of the K-band antenna uh, receiver. Uh, and yeah, you can see that the feed actually is small enough that it also fits inside the cryostat and is also cooled down to 15 Kelvin. So, Everything in this receiver, uh, except the heat shield, sits at 15 Kelvin. This is an um, electronic enclosure, again, uh, water-cooled for stabilization, temperature stabilization. And this is the post-amp uh, and mixer stage of the, of the K-band antenna. And all of this uh, plumbing is done in-house here. Uh, this is the, the latest um, receiver being built here at Hartrau, and this is a, just an X-band single polarization test receiver 
that we are going to use for the pointing measurements on the Vigas antenna. And again, uh, there you can see we went back to our uh, eight inch uh, tubular section uh, for, the, for the cryostat. On this one, we experimented and did something new for the first time. And um, uh, colleagues will know that it's always a challenge to uh, thermally insulate your um, RF adapter site or your OMT site, which is, sits at cryo, and then your feed, which sits at 300 Kelvin. And so in this case, we designed and made a composite waveguide. Um, there you can see the composite waveguide that we use to insulate the, the uh, 15 Kelvin stage from the 300 Kelvin stage outside. And it's just a, a very thin uh, composite section, circular waveguide that is metallized on the inside. That is a side view of the feed cone of the 26 meter antenna. And uh, so that feed cone, we've got seven receivers on the antenna, uh, six of them inside the feed cone. L band, uh, which is the one here on the, on the side, is just too big to fit inside the feed cone. And so that one is strapped onto the side. Uh, but the others are all uh, in a north south line inside the feed cone. That presents a bit of a challenge when we have to do geodetic um, VLBI using S and X band because the, the S band is on one side of the cone here yeah, and the X band sits on the other side of the, of the cone. And again, this was uh, one of those uh, Friday afternoon uh, hurried projects where we needed to come up with a solution. And uh, a set of diacritic mirrors was built to split the beam. So the first uh, diacritic mirror sits above the X-band receiver and it's got a perforated flat mirror. So the, the X-band uh, beam can pass through the, through the mirror and the S-band portion is reflected off the flat mirror onto a curved mirror above the S-band and then down into the S-band receiver. And that way we split the beam and we can do simultaneous S and X band uh, observations. That's just another view of the antenna uh, showing the dichroic mirrors installed on top of the uh, feed cone. Then we go on to some other projects that we do uh, here at uh, Hartrau. Um, in 2008, while we were having tea outside the tea room, uh, the antenna, the 26 meter antenna was slewing from one source to the other when it made these horrible, horrible noises. And um, we subsequently investigated and discovered that uh, the hour angle south bearing uh, failed. Um, we got the guys from SKF out here to come and put the instrumentation on and see what they can tell us. And uh, it was interesting to look at the, the guy's face when he, when he ran all the data into, his, into the simulation software. And uh, he all of a sudden looked up at me and says, well, this bearing was supposed to fail 10 years ago. So I said, well, it, it lasted 10 years longer, but now we need to replace it. And uh, yeah, so then we started a huge project to replace that bearing. And of course, that is no easy task. Uh, eventually, the company that assisted us with that uh, was General Dynamics from the States. And uh, another interesting story was that the originally the hour angle shaft came pre-assembled from the States. That was now back in, in 1960 uh, when it was constructed. And it was 
assembled inside a factory and the, the bearing fit on the shaft and the housing was both interference fits on the housing and the shaft. So that makes life complicated if you want to field fit a new bearing on, and it's an interference fit on the, on the shaft and the housing. So one of the interesting things that General Dynamics did was in their uh, design study, they tried and, uh, to find the people that were involved in the design and assembly of the shaft. And they managed to find the guy that actually designed the shaft in an old age home. And they had a good interview with him discussing the possible um, replacement of the bearing in situ. So they sent guys out to, to help us with that. Um, it was a, a six week project. Um, I think it was messy at times, um, but yeah, there you can see uh, some of the uh, breakage where the inner ring literally split uh, chunks off. Uh, some of the rollers were broken in half. Uh, yeah, it was, it was not a nice sight to, to find a bearing like that. We had to make a more or less comfortable work environment with scaffolding and, and boards and do it, uh, do our best there. It was in the middle of winter in South Africa at that time. And that you can also get quite cold here in winter. So it was challenging at times. Uh, this is where we, we prepared to fit the new bearing. And having explained now that is an interference fit, we needed to heat the inner ring of the bearing, cool the shaft down with liquid nitrogen, then cool the outer ring of the bearing uh, again with liquid nitrogen and heat the housing all simultaneously. So at one end you have plus 80 degrees and on the other hand you have like minus 200 uh, degrees and you don't know where to touch anymore because either way you get <laughs> uh, temperature burns. Finally, the new bearing was in and looks much better. And then we finished off by replacing all the supporting parts and bolting everything back together again. Uh, this was just a project where we replaced the, the drive gearboxes, the bearings inside the drive uh, gearboxes of the 26 meter. And uh, all of this work is also done in situ, in-house. Um, we, we really have the capacity and means to, to do all of these heavy work. And now we get to a really interesting story. This is back to SKA, the, the, the early years when they set off to find a nice RFI quiet spot. And um, this trailer was the first trailer to be built for the for RFI surveys. So it's got a, a container with all the equipment in it, a generator on the front, a jack up mast at the back where the antenna would go and then they this would go out in the felt and survey uh, for RFI um, interference. We received a call that the trailer broke in half. Uh, those Karoo roads are not kind to trailers. Um, and we had to rush down to Canoven and uh, fix this trailer. So we got a, we brought a new trailer. Now we need to transfer all the equipment onto the new trailer. So I asked around, so we found it there at the uh, workshop of uh, Leon Swanepoel, the local windpump mechanic. And we asked around whether they've got a, a crane available in town or a forklift or a TLB, but there was nothing. So we needed to, get all of this heavy equipment off the trailer and onto the new trailer. So the best alternate that we could get 
was the blue gum tree outside of uh, Leon Swanepoel's workshop. And uh, we rigged our block and tackles in the, in the tree and hoisted everything off the old trailer and onto the new trailer. And uh, there you can see the equipment being transferred onto the, onto the new trailer. I believe that blue gum, tree, blue gum tree is still standing strong there. So if anybody needs to do some hoisting, uh, I know that one is strong. Right. Um, then we're getting close to the end of our presentation. And uh, I thought, uh, since this is mostly an engineering view, um, it's not fair not to mention geodesy, but Rolf has assured me he's making plans for a follow-up talk. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Uh, the big items I just want to mention is for geodesy, we've really established a core site at RTBS Took, and you can see we have a lot of equipment here um, sort of co-located um, which is also a necessity for geodetic work. Um, at the same time, there are a new, is a new core site in um, work in progress at Mikey's Fontan. Um, so currently there's two GNSS uh, receivers, as well as a, a seismometer and some meteor, um, what's it, net stations, uh, weather stations. Apart from that, how to be a stuck in the geodesy program is also keeping a lot of other uh, geodetic related equipment running all over. So throughout uh, Africa, um, there are various stations um, in Namibia, Botswana, uh, Zambia, uh, as you can see here, here all over. Um, some of them are just uh, GPS stations at the moment. Some have uh, a bit of extra equipment, uh, some tidal gauges and so forth. Um, and one of the, or the main way to get there is a Toyota Fortuner. Um, so that's quite, quite well kitted. For the rest, we also venture a bit further than uh, land and some might know some might not but there are a few other stations so here to the left um, that pinpoint there in the middle of the ocean is Scoff Island um, this pinpoint here is uh, Marion Island and here at the bottom I'm hoping you can see it but because it's cut off on my screen is Antarctica where uh, South Africa also has a base. Um, and to get there, again, some pieces of equipment. Um, the SA Agalis 2 these days, uh, helicopters and boats in some cases. Where we still continue hosting scientific equipment, uh, tidal gauges. Um, on Marion, there's also a seismometer. Um, I think on Gough Island as well but I might be mistaken. Um, this is a GNSS receiver that um, was installed, I think, uh, early 2000s already, and that's still going strong in Antarctica. Um, so yeah, all over. But we're looking forward to the talk by Rolf to go into more detail on that. To round everything off, um, we end with uh, a uh, important aspect of research and development. And as Peter has already mentioned, there's a lot happening and it's not usually um, what you read in textbooks. Um, a lot of the things we do on this side, we try out uh, first and then write about it later, hopefully. Um, so some of the work uh, in that respect is um, our new or uh, newly um, 
new collaborations with Sansa. So Sansa, the top station, they are all the years busy with space missions. And uh, the last that uh, there has been renewed interest in landing on the moon and other deep space missions. Unfortunately, Sansa's equipment, they have about a 12 meter antenna, that's their uh, largest diameter antenna. And though it's adequate to send uh, messages and telemetry and command data to satellites, it's not strong enough to receive those weak signals. And this is where our 26 meter came in, where we're working with them. They transmit telemetry and command information up to the satellites um, because they are uh, the service provider for people like NASA and so forth. And then we receive the, the, uh, the signal from the satellite using the 26 meter antenna with additional sensitivity it gets passed through a radio frequency over fiber transmitters all the way three kilometers up the road to them. And it's as if they're using one single antenna. Um, and most of the time, this is also managed from overseas. So you're now having NASA or so in a control room in Houston, uh, controlling the telemetry and command data via South Africa to a satellite or a launch uh, a lunar lander or so. Uh, this is an image of the waveguide that Peter talked about. So the, I think a G10 fiberglass um, and uh, we're anxiously awaiting to put this on the Vegas antenna to, to get some real world um, data to see how, how good does this actually work. Um, but it looks promising from the lab tests. Uh, this is one of our newest designs. So we are busy preparing for a gravitational deformation study on the 26 meter antenna. And for that, uh, it's necessary to mount a uh, like our total station, a laser uh, station on the antenna that is kept vertical regardless of where the antenna is pointing. So this is an in-house design. Peter came up with this um, and pretty much with just via gravity, it will keep the instrument vertical. And while we're doing measurements, uh, this blue part here will actually be a door magnet, uh, which is a simple el electromagnetic break for us, uh, sufficient to keep the laser total station in position and stationary while it's measuring and scanning the dish surface. Our work also involves some other custom, custom jobs. So, um, this frame on the back of our bucky is also built in-house. Um, you might not know, but this is also upcycled material. So uh, as we reused the quad legs of the 26 meter antenna for our receivers, we have reused the packing frames for our Vegas antenna to make tables outside our kitchen area, uh, outside seating, there's a few control room uh, tables that have been made um, and this frame for transporting goods and materials, especially steel and pipes and so forth uh, on our engineering bucky. Uh, it's uh, easy to strap it to the bucky, but it's also loose so you can easily just lift it up with two people and um, put it on the ground when you don't need that type of transportation method. Uh, also, Peter has pointed out, it's a, a workable mobile workbench. You just need a top. Uh, coming to our second last slide now, uh, radio interference is always an issue. Um, 
This is also one of our side projects and we're hoping that Wi-Fi signals that are currently uh, around the observatory to change it from such a constant stream to a simple pinpoint with a nice notification just telling you, listen, um, you forgot your laptop Wi-Fi on, you need to turn it off so that you don't cause interference for us. Um, at the moment, it's, it's very noisy. There's a lot of interference, but within time, hopefully it will look more like this bottom graph rather than the top one. And then finishing off with a, a, a bit of an engineering joke almost, uh, one would think this is a simple presentation and we've already run into some technical difficulties after testing all the connections out just an hour beforehand. Um, but this is the setup we have here in the library and the library annex. Um, and it again started out simple. We want a, to do a presentation, but we have two speakers. So uh, we can use microphones. There's two on the desk as we are using them now. Um, there's a, a mixer or audio mixer to take those signals and seamlessly uh, put it into Zoom. So Peter can talk while I'm talking and it's like a conversation going on. Uh, we even have a microphone going out to the library section if there's any questions after this. Um, but all of a sudden you realize with these nice new technology, uh, it starts picking up the vibration of tapping keys on the keyboard and so on. So in comes foam uh, packing, packing tape, uh, not packing tape, but um, foam insulation used in packaging, um, just so that the vibrations from the table is not picked up. Um, finally, once almost done, uh, doing a quick dry run yesterday, Peter noticed that um, I couldn't st sit still enough in these chairs. Um, <laughs> So these chairs actually creak loud enough for you also to pick it up. So a simple presentation quickly uh, escalated into a engineering uh, design process. I think this is version four of our design process. Um, and with that, we ended off. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's really, really impressive. Does anyone have any questions that you want to ask or anything that you're interested in? Hey, thanks for the nice presentation. Tell me, um, for Artemis Hook, what is the primary science that the 26 meters is doing at the moment? Or the top two or top three? Shoot, that's a, that's a tough one now, the shooting out of the hip because we are now from engineering and not from the science side. Um, but the 26 meter is still used for, for some geodetic work to maintain the, the, the reference frame. It's doing um, K-band reference framework. Uh, and that is actually a, a very special one where it was included now recently, um, the 24 gigahertz um, portion uh, into the uh, international uh, celestial reference frame. Uh, it's still doing uh, maser monitoring, uh, pulsars. Um, so yeah, but I'm, I'm now speaking from engineering, shooting from the hip. So I think um, uh, there will be, it'll be a good idea to also get uh, the scientists from ATRA to actually present um, in one of these sessions, uh, the work that we do. And in terms of the operations, do you like have a schedule for the day? Is there an operator that's checking things off or how do you? Yeah. So most, of the, um, uh, most of the operations are almost automatic. Um, again, the, there are schedules, but it's best to speak to the scientists about that. Um, the antenna, uh, all the antennas really participate 
into um, international uh, VLBIs. So that's usually uh, pre-planned quite in advance, almost a year in advance. But in between, uh, there's almost, I don't want to say gap fillers, but we fully utilize the antenna. So during the day, um, uh, the scientists put, on, put together a schedule and it runs. And luckily, since we are in the same building as the antenna, we have this nasty alarm going off if something's wrong. So engineering is quite close by to to uh, fix any problems. And we've got Fani here to, from, from uh, the scientists who can quickly brief us on uh, exactly what we do. Thank you, Fani. Hi guys, um, it's Fani Fani here. Um, I'm the staff astronomer on site. And just to clarify, um, I do the scheduling for the single dish every single day. So um, what we are, routine if you can put it like that is um we basically start from l band and put in all the l band sources and when it's done we go up to c band ku band and k band and then rotate all the way around um, and it takes about a week to go off through all the sources at all the frequencies but yes i as as the, the days observations is done, I take the files out and put new files in and rotate them up. Uh, Peter, I have a question. It's Adrian. Um, the uh, bed of nails that you used in the uh, surface uh, respin, um, I've always been curious exactly how did you set the nail profile to match the, you know, can you just run us through, you, you took a, a panel off and then it went to the bed of nails and what did you do to set the profile and to get the new metal, please, just a bit more detail. Uh, for that, we'll, we'll quickly pause, uh, pause that question while uh, Fani just swaps out with Peter again. Um, uh, I'm not so well versed in the bed of bolts or bed of nails as they, they called it. Um, Peter's just getting into the room again, and he'll take you through it because he was quite involved in that process. Yes. So, Peter. Sorry about that. Yeah, Peter, the uh, the bed of bolts that you used for the the panel respin on this twenty six meter. Mm -hmm. I just to you to take us through the process when you took off a panel from the from the dish. You went to the bed of nails. How did you adjust the, the, the nails or the, the, the bolts to get the profile to stretch the panel and, and fit that piece? Some detail there. Yeah, so, so that was done. On, on top of it, we had a permanent um, rail system where we had a commercial DRO system that is used on, on uh, milling machines and lathes. And that was used to individually, the, the, the bed of bolts um, had a, a spacing of 100 millimeters square. So, so um, it, was, it was just a, a, a 100 millimeters separation between the bolts uh, in X and Y. And uh, from that, we then got the theoretical profile and then derived the specific um, height offset in a, in a grid of 100 by 100 millimeters and adjusted each bolt um, according to manually with the, with the DRO readout. So it was calibrated, zeroed, and then measured across uh, each bolt uh, on, the, on the bed of bolts. And that was it. I don't know if I explained it. it yeah, sure. It's, it's, I mean, how many bolts are there and how long did it take you to, and then I presume you took it ring by ring because each ring has the same profile, right? Yeah, so it was done ring by ring. I think ring three and four, ring three and four was was done simultaneously because the panels were small enough that we could fit uh, two panels on a on a on a on on the bed of bolts. Uh, so that one that one the two were done simultaneously, but it was done ring for ring 
So we did one setting um, and then uh, did all the, uh, all the panels for that ring on that one setting. You still have to say how long it took you to, to set the, the bolts. Uh, it was probably, let's, you, it, it's a long time ago, but, but let's say it, it was about two days work to, to set it. Um, uh, we didn't have a, a clocking system back then, yeah. uh, like Clockify. Clockify yeah. wasn't active at that time. Um, yeah, but it was was about two two days to set the to set the the, the bolts. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question from my side: the molds, the XDM mold. Did anybody yes. put that into a bird bath or a swimming pool, or what happened to that? No, it's still standing there. Um, I still have a I still have a project for it. Um, if if I get a bit of funding, we want to actually move it to outside the the kitchen area and raise it about two meters in the air and use it for a recreation area. Um, so yeah, paint it white on top and just raise it. Uh, it's a nice um, uh, dry area. But other than that, nothing. Yeah. Thanks. It's for sale if you want to. Okay, I guess you answered everything. It was really, really amazing. I'm really impressed. And thank you so much for um, doing this and being the first team internally to host or present a lunch and learn. It's really appreciated. If there's uh, anybody that still have uh, questions afterwards or so, uh, they are welcome to contact us via email as well. Or visit us.